We must one day come face to face with the inevitable, suffering and pain. For humankind, pain is almost unavoidable. Studying to pass an examination, or practicing to be good at a particular skill involves some form of pain, but to a lesser degree compared to the pain felt when we lose a loved one, or when we are hit with a fatal incurable disease and realize that our death is sooner than we might have expected. Facing death squarely in the eye, our perspective of the world suddenly changes. At this point, most people will hold on to the belief that the real opportunities of life have passed. Yet, in reality, there is an opportunity and a challenge. We could make a victory of our experiences, turning life into an inner triumph, or we could ignore the challenge and simply vegetate. Instead of taking life's difficulties as a test of our inner strength, we do not take our life seriously and despise it as something of no consequence. We prefer to close our eyes and to live in the past. Life for us becomes meaningless. Let's explore the struggles and pain that the German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche endured throughout his life. Nietzsche faced severe health problems that plagued him for most of his days. Initially, he started his career as a classical philologist and quickly rose to prominence becoming the youngest person to hold the chair of philology at the University of Basel in 1869, at just 24 years old. However, due to his ongoing health issues, he resigned 10 years later. Despite his suffering, this period was incredibly productive for Nietzsche, as he wrote many of the works that continue to offer wisdom and inspiration today. In 1889, at the age of 44, Nietzsche experienced a devastating collapse that led to a complete loss of his mental faculties and paralysis. He spent the rest of his life being cared for by his mother until her death in 1897, and then by his sister Elizabeth. Sadly, Nietzsche passed away in 1900 after contracting pneumonia and suffering multiple strokes. This philosopher, who endured immense pain throughout his life, was the one who gave us the phrase, a more fatty, which means love of fate, my formula for greatness in a human being is a more fatty. That one wants nothing to be other than it is, not in the future, not in the past, not in all eternity. Not merely to endure that which happens of necessity, but to love it. In this video, we will learn how to attain inner strength and triumph in the face of our inevitable pain and suffering by drawing inspiration from a certain American writer Flannery O'Connor who endured a deadly disease she inherited. Despite her suffering, remained internally dignified till the very end. Born in 1925 in Savannah, Georgia. As a young girl, O'Connor shared a strong bond with her father, who instilled her love for literature and art. Their entire mindset and emotions appeared to be perfectly aligned. The harmony between them was evident when her father engaged in the games she created. He effortlessly immersed himself in the essence of it all, and his imagination effortlessly flowed in a parallel path to hers. They possessed an extraordinary ability to communicate without uttering a single word. Around the mid-1930s, O'Connor's life gradually started to take a downturn when her father fell ill with systemic lupus erythematosus, an autoimmune disease in which the immune system attacks its own tissues, causing widespread inflammation and tissue damage in the affected organs a disease that was incurable at that time. As his health deteriorated and he became unable to work, the family had no choice but to relocate to her mother's house in Milledgeville, Georgia. Tragically, on February 1, 1941, at the age of 45, her father succumbed to lupus, leaving her devastated by the loss of this close relationship. In 1945, O'Connor received a scholarship to the University of Iowa. It was there that she encountered influential writers and critics who taught or lectured at the university. Paul Engel, the director of Iowa's Writers' Workshop, recognized O'Connor's exceptional talent and described her as one of the most gifted writers he had ever taught. Engel was the first person to read and provide feedback on the initial draft of what would eventually become her first novel, Wise Blood, published in 1952. After her time at the university, O'Connor was accepted into Yaddo, an artist's retreat in Saratoga Springs. Several months later, she moved to an apartment owned by her friends, Sally and Robert Fitzgerald in Richville, Connecticut. While staying at the Fitzgerald's apartment, 
O'Connor experienced her first life-threatening incident. She went back to Georgia to see a doctor. She was diagnosed with arthritis. Having sufficiently recovered, O'Connor returned to Connecticut. During a conversation with Sally, she revealed to O'Connor a shocking truth. Her ailment wasn't arthritis, but lupus. Her mother, feeling that the truth would be too much for her daughter to bear, in alliance with the doctor, convinced O'Connor that her condition was arthritis. O'Connor discovered she not only inherited her father's love for literature but also his disease. Overwhelmed with sadness, she realized she had to permanently go back to Milledgeville. With little time for contemplation, she resolved to confront her challenges head-on. She embraced her fate and, aware of the limited time available, immersed herself even more passionately in writing. People who knew her during this period observed that she seldom complained about her illness and usually maintained a cheerful disposition. She returned to Milledgeville and resided on the family farm in Andalusia, just outside of town. As the years went by and her lupus advanced, O'Connor gradually lost her mobility. She spent more time in the hospital than at home, yet she never ceased writing despite enduring agonizing lupus treatments. In 1964, O'Connor received a diagnosis of cancer and underwent surgery. However, due to complications related to lupus, she fell into a coma and never regained consciousness. On August 3, 1964, at the age of 39, Flannery O'Connor passed away. For the majority of people, when they encounter adversities that are irredeemable, like Flannery O'Connor with her disease, they find it hard to recover emotionally from these setbacks. By giving in to their losses, they slowly decline mentally, accompanied by bitterness about their fate. Just like an animal that surrenders to the harsh conditions of its environment when it cannot adapt to the challenges, these individuals are similarly affected by their inability to adjust to the changes in their life circumstances. When it comes to adversities we have no control over, our natural reaction is to complain, to blame our plight on external factors. While it is true that these factors bear some responsibility for our predicaments, putting blame on them momentarily brings us comfort. In the long run, we relinquish our accountability for our lives, implying that these factors are responsible and to blame. What benefit do we gain by placing the burden of responsibility on others? Instead, we must adopt this life-transforming approach, despite the debilitating impact of her illness and the excruciating pain she endured, O'Connor persevered in her writing. Even during her hospital stays, she managed to carve out time to write. Though physically limited, her mind remained open, constantly seeking avenues for growth in her craft. Her physical condition failed to suppress her creative prowess as her mind embraced ideas and delved into the spirit of her characters. Her final written work, Everything That Rises Must Converge, was composed at the painstaking pace of only five lines per day. Years ago, the Viennese psychiatrist Viktor Frankl read a letter written by a young invalid, in which he told a friend that he had just found out he would not live for long, that even an operation would be of no help. He wrote further that he remembered a film he had seen in which a man was portrayed who waited for death in a courageous and dignified way. The boy had thought it a great accomplishment to meet death so well. Now, he wrote, fate was offering him a similar chance. It's important to remember that optimism cannot be forced or commanded. You can't simply make yourself be optimistic against all odds or without hope. Happiness cannot be directly pursued. It comes as a result of something. You need a reason to be happy. And once you find that reason, happiness follows naturally. Essentially, people are not just chasing happiness. They are searching for reasons to be happy by uncovering the potential meaning in their situations. Living means experiencing suffering, and surviving means finding meaning in that suffering. If life has a purpose, then suffering and dying must also have a purpose. However, no one can tell another person what that purpose is. Each individual must discover it for themselves and take responsibility for their answer. If they succeed, they will continue to grow despite all difficulties. Life's circumstances can conspire to make a person feel like they are losing everything they know. What remains is the last of human freedoms, the ability to choose one's attitude in a given set of circumstances. 
how a person accepts their fate and the suffering it brings, how they carry their burdens, provides them with the opportunity, even in the hardest times, to add deeper meaning to their life. They can remain brave, dignified, and unselfish, or they might lose their sense of humanity and act solely out of self-preservation. This is a person's chance to either embrace or neglect the moral values that difficult situations can offer. This choice determines whether they are worthy of their suffering. Don't think these ideas are too abstract or distant from real life. It's true that only a few people can reach such high moral standards, but history provides ample proof that inner strength can lift a person above their external circumstances. Everywhere we face fate, we have the chance to achieve something meaningful through our own suffering.